It has been said that there cannot be great art without great suffering. In this session, we'll discuss a 19th century artist whose life seemed to be the ultimate example of this proverb, Vincent van Gogh. Van Gogh produced some of the most beautiful art of modern times. His paintings now bring the highest prices of any paintings on earth, millions of dollars for a single canvas. His paintings are also among the most recognizable to the general public. Whether or not people can recall their titles, they are deeply familiar with the images from his most famous works, including Sunflowers, Starry Night, The Potato Eaters, The Night Cafe, The Church at Over, Bedroom at Arles, and, of course, his intense and disturbing self-portraits. Today, Van Gogh's paintings are admired worldwide. They're among the most popular attractions in museums lucky enough to house them, and both museums and individuals bid desperately to try and acquire them. There is a sad irony to the enormous success of Vincent Van Gogh, for in his own lifetime, he was a failure professionally. He sold only one painting, and that for a mere $80. There was almost no one who believed in him or supported him, with the notable exception of his younger brother, Theo. He was the classic starving artist, living months at a time on bread and nuts, unable to buy clothes or furniture or to meet his rent. There were times he couldn't even afford to buy paint and worked instead with a mixture of coffee grounds. His personal life, too, was streaked with tragedy, even from the time he was very young. He was considered odd and volatile and had no friends. He was unable to hold down a job and tried profession after profession until he finally settled on painting. His parents disapproved of him and considered him an embarrassment. He had several love affairs, often with what might be called inappropriate women, his cousin, a prostitute, and an unwed mother. Every relationship he had ended in disaster and triggered a deep depression. Throughout his life, he was painfully lonely and bereft of company and friends. Most importantly, he suffered from a severe mental imbalance that biographers and historians have been unable to identify. It's possible he had epilepsy, for he occasionally seemed to have seizures. It's likely he was a manic depressive. We know only that he was haunted by nightmares, hallucinations, rages, and melancholy. He spent time in mental asylums and under the care of a personal physician. None of this helped. When he killed himself with a revolver in a field in southern France, he was only 37 years old. He remains today the very model of the tormented genius. That he was a genius is unquestionable. Vincent van Gogh's use of color and texture was unlike that of any artist before him. His use of bold, wavy lines in his paintings gave them a sense of life and movement. Trees sway, chairs reach out and welcome, stars explode, flowers pulsate, fields undulate, and the whole atmosphere seems to quiver and vibrate. Van Gogh belongs to a school of art called post-impressionism. He didn't know he was a post-impressionist. It was a term developed years after he died by two 20th century English art critics. In a sense, post-impressionism is a general phase used to describe the art movement that followed Impressionism, the movement of the late 1880s that included artists like Renoir, Monet, Degas, and Cassatt. Post-Impressionism covers a short period of time from about 1880 to the end of the century. The post-Impressionists used the same bright colors that had typified Impressionism, but they added a whole new focus on the meaning of the painting. They were less interested in imitating the real world and more interested in creating their own world of feeling and mood and spirit. The emphasis was not on what the eye saw, but how the mind perceived what it saw. Van Gogh is a leading post-impressionist, but others included Paul Cezanne, George Seurat, Toulouse-Lautrec, and Paul Gauguin, one of Van Gogh's few friends. Van Gogh began where the Impressionists left off and took art in an entirely new direction. He's known for his thick pigments. Sometimes he discarded brushes altogether and applied his paint right from the tube. He's known for his use of bright colors, some of which he didn't even bother to mix. And he's known for his long brush strokes, which create contours across the canvas. All of these techniques give Van Gogh's paintings an intensity and emotion that makes them seem as if they're alive and breathing. His pictures are considered among the most psychologically powerful ever created. His own powerful emotions, his anguished mind, his tortured soul, pour onto and out from the canvas. 
we are able to have much insight into that soul and into the man who hosted it because besides his paintings, Vincent van Gogh left behind 750 letters to his brother Theo. The letters are lucid and eloquent. Besides describing the details of his ordinary life, they reveal Van Gogh's hopes and fears and his philosophy about art, humanity, and God. Together they offer us a picture of a man who, though plagued by despair and prone to violent outbursts, was also deeply compassionate, selfless, and idealistic. Because Van Gogh did most of his painting in France, people sometimes mistakenly believe he was French. He was not. Vincent Van Gogh was Dutch. He was born March 30, 1853, in a quiet village in the Netherlands named Zundert. His father was a strict Protestant clergyman whom Van Gogh deeply admired but could never please. His mother came from a family of bookbinders. Vincent was one of six children, but in a sense, there was always a seventh lurking in the shadows. The seventh was a boy who had been born before Vincent, but who had died in infancy. This boy was also named Vincent. Miraculously, the second Vincent had been born on the exact same day as the first, a year later, which may be why his parents gave him the same name. Today, psychologists would wonder about that choice. Van Gogh always thought of himself as the second Vincent, and his parents, when they disapproved of his behavior, often remarked on how sure they were that the first Vincent would have behaved better. Vincent Van Gogh was instilled with a sense of inadequacy from the moment he was born. Balancing this curse of the brother who preceded him was the great blessing of the brother who followed him. When Vincent was four, his brother Theo was born. Theo adored Vincent and remained devoted to him throughout his life, regularly sending him money and nursing him through his many illnesses and breakdowns. As a youth, Van Gogh attended boarding school and then entered secondary school where he excelled in languages. He could speak Dutch, German, French, and English. When he completed school, it was time to choose a profession, but Vincent had no clear idea what he wanted to do in his life. It was then that Providence stepped in. His family arranged for him to work with an uncle who owned an art gallery in The Hague. He joined as a junior clerk and suddenly found himself in the stimulating atmosphere of the art world. He read art journals, started collecting prints, and became personally acquainted with many amateur and professional artists. After five years, he was transferred by the company to London, and it was here he would have one of the desperate love affairs that would become a pattern in his life. Van Gogh fell in love with his landlady's daughter, who rejected his offer of marriage. Devastated, he found himself unable to work. In an attempt to rouse him from his misery, his uncle's company sent him to Paris, but Vincent refused to stay. He returned to London and was again ordered back to Paris. This time, he refused to go. Instead, he spent all his time reading the Bible. Exasperated, the company fired him. The year was now 1876, and Van Gogh was 23 years old. While in London, Van Gogh saw a side of life he had never known before. He discovered the terrible slums of the East End and became convinced he must do something to help the poor. To Vincent, it was a way to do God's work in the world, to serve him by serving his children. He began to think about becoming a preacher. But first, he found a position as a teacher, a position that he himself terminated when he found the school was unable to pay him. Following that, his family once again found him a job, this time at a bookstore. Again, he showed no interest in his work. He spent his time taking long walks in the countryside, studying nature, and making his first attempts at drawing. Soon, he found that his sketches were his refuge. He began to send Theo his drawings and told him that drawing brought him more pleasure than anything else in life. He said, Provided we remember what we see, we need never be empty or really lonely. After the bookstore failed, Vincent finally decided that his career in life had to be one of service, and he resolved to be a preacher like his father. For 15 months, he studied for his theological exams, but when he finally took the exam, he failed and he was rejected by the university. Next, he enrolled in a course for missionaries, but he failed in this course, too. It wasn't that he lacked intelligence or initiative. Most of his failed studies were due to his inability to accept what was being taught. He argued with his teachers, refuted their theories, and refused to accept their criticism. They considered him belligerent and rebellious. Finally, in 1878, Van Gogh went to work as a mission preacher to the coal miners in a depressed area of Belgium. 
He had a strong sense of social justice and a lifelong compassion for the poor, so he approached the coal mines not just as a missionary, but as an activist. He shared his money with the mining families. He lived as they did, rubbing coal dust on his face and hands and descending into the dangerous mine shafts. He gave away his bed and slept on the floor. He took to wearing an old tunic and a shabby hat. Then he gave away even the tunic and took to wearing shirts made out of old sacks. When a fire broke out in the mines, Vincent went to help bandage the injured. His behavior was considered extreme and bizarre. He was too devoted, too selfless. The Evangelical Council found his interpretations of Christ's teachings too literal and warned him to change his ways. Instead, Vincent became more committed. When the miners went on strike after a mine explosion, Vincent supported them. This defiance against authority was more than the Council could tolerate. They sent notice of his dismissal. Disappointed and disillusioned, Vincent wandered barefoot through the countryside, sleeping in the open and accepting food from benevolent strangers. He continued to send his drawings to Theo, who was now an art dealer in Paris. Theo encouraged him to continue with his art. He saw promise. Within Vincent, a seed of thought began to take root. Perhaps he could fill his burning desire to serve mankind through his art. During this time, Van Gogh made simple sketches of the miners and peasants and drew some landscapes. They were unpolished drawings, and the colors were very dark, expressing the poverty of the area and how deeply it affected him. When he was called back from the mining town, Van Gogh was at first unwilling to give up the missionary work, so he tried once again in another community. When this, too, was unsuccessful, he began to think again about dedicating himself to art. Realizing that his happiest moments were when he was drawing, he finally resolved to devote himself to it full time. With financial help from Theo, Vincent went to Brussels to study art. Until then, he'd made most of his sketches from prints, but in Brussels, he had his first opportunity to use live models for his work. Finding live models to pose for him would be a problem for Van Gogh through his entire career. His fiery moods and eccentric behavior discouraged people from wanting to sit for him. He wrote to Theo, Whatever I do, I do not inspire confidence. How then could I be useful in any way to anyone? I am very easily swayed by passions. I am capable of doing, indeed I am likely to do, things which are more or less mad and which I am usually somewhat sorry for afterwards. Now, bearing this in mind, what am I to do? Ought I to consider myself a dangerous fellow, incapable of doing anything worthwhile? I do not think so. My job is to put my own passions to some good use. In 1881, Van Gogh returned to Holland to stay with his parents and launched his second disastrous love affair, this time with a young widowed cousin. This love, too, was unrequited. Unable to accept her rejection, Van Gogh followed her to Amsterdam, where he terrified her parents by thrusting his hand into a lamp and saying, Let me see her for as long as I can keep my hand in this flame. Instead, they sent him away. After that, Van Gogh went once more to The Hague, where he studied the works of the Dutch masters, particularly Rembrandt, and began painting street scenes and landscapes. He was desperately poor, in spite of allowances sent by Theo, and he was desperately lonely. He took in an unmarried pregnant woman named Sien, along with her five-year-old daughter, a move that shocked his family and friends so much that they stopped communicating with him. Only Theo remained loyal, although he too disapproved. The relationship with Sien, like all of Van Gogh's relationships, was short-lived. After a year, he returned to live with his parents again and to have yet another star-crossed affair, this time with his parents' next-door neighbor. This young woman, unlike previous ones, did want to marry Van Gogh, but her parents objected. In despair, she attempted suicide. A scandal resulted, and Van Gogh was forced to leave town. Although he never attained the love he so desperately desired, Van Gogh once said, It is good to love many things, for therein lies strength, and whosoever loves much performs much and can accomplish much, and what is done with love is well done. During this period, Van Gogh was continuing to draw and paint, using peasants and landscapes as his primary subjects. The year after scandal forced him out of his parents' home, he painted his first masterpiece, the potato eaters. He also painted his first self-portrait. It shows him at his easel, reddish hair cut short and standing straight up, a stubbly beard and deep, narrow blue eyes. 
He has jutting brows, a high forehead, and there are already wrinkles and lines on his young face. A friend once said of Van Gogh, his face was homely and covered with freckles, but changed and brightened wonderfully when warmed with enthusiasm. In 1885, Van Gogh left for Antwerp to study the work of Rubens, and it was there that he also became fascinated with Japanese prints. The bright colors in Japanese art would later have a profound effect on his own work, which started out dark and somber and became lighter and brighter as the years progressed. He once wrote to Theo, All my work, in a way, is founded on Japanese art. Their work is as simple as breathing. If we look at Japanese art, we see an artist who is wise, philosophic, and intelligent. These Japanese live in nature as though they themselves were flowers. Antwerp, in spite of the joyous discovery of Japanese art, was a study in misery. Vincent was so poor, he lived almost completely on bread. When Theo sent some extra money, he bought a proper meal, only to find he couldn't digest it. His teeth were broken and decayed and needed replacing. A doctor told him he was having an absolute physical breakdown. Frightened and not knowing where else to turn, he turned to the one who always welcomed him and boarded a train for Paris and Theo. He never returned north again. In Paris, Vincent and Theo shared an apartment crammed with works of art. Once again, Van Gogh entered art school, and this time he began to meet some of the painters who would later gain fame in the post-impressionism movement. They included Toulouse-Lautrec, Monet, Degas, Pissarro, and Gauguin. Pissarro encouraged him to use more color in his work, and so Van Gogh, already impressed with the color in Japanese art, began to explore new styles. An important event in art history took place while Van Gogh was in Paris, the last exhibition of Impressionism. Van Gogh attended and studied the vibrant colors and the daring brushstrokes of his predecessors. Then he began experimenting with similar styles. Meanwhile, he was absorbing the styles of neo-impressionists like George Seurat and Paul Signac, who were working with the pointillist technique, using tiny dots of colors to construct form. From all these influences, Impressionism, Neo-Impressionism, and Japanese art, Van Gogh began to develop a style of his own. He worked quickly, hoping to capture spontaneous feelings before they were lost. He also began signing his work. Van Gogh always used the signature Vincent because he felt Van Gogh was too difficult to pronounce. He was right. Although most people refer to him as Van Gogh, the true pronunciation of his name is Van Gogh. During this period, Vincent produced many still lifes with flowers and several self-portraits, the latter partly because he had trouble finding models. During only three years in Paris, his style shifted dramatically from the dark, somber tones of his Belgian work to a brighter, more colorful style that would eventually become his trademark. Meanwhile, Van Gogh was beginning to exhibit the signs of mental strain that would eventually lead to several breakdowns and his eventual death. He was nervous and often irritable, quick to argue, and sometimes violent in his arguments. His friends stopped visiting, and only Theo remained by his side. Theo once wrote, It seems as if he were two persons, one marvelously gifted, gentle, and refined, the other egotistic and hard-hearted. Van Gogh's health was beginning to fail, and he longed for the open air and sunshine of the country. He decided to move to the south of France, where he hoped he could recover his health and where he also hoped he could fulfill a cherished dream. This dream, which he held on to for many years, was to establish an artist community in the country. He hoped to build a working group of what he called Impressionists of the South. He set out for Arles in 1888, inviting his artist friends to follow and join him. Together, they would paint, commiserate, study, and enjoy long walks in the countryside. He was particularly anxious that his friend Paul Gauguin join him, but Gauguin, like the others, was unwilling to commit. Van Gogh set out alone and found himself a small yellow house in the bright sunlight where he proceeded to create many of his masterpieces. The subject of one of these was his own light blue bedroom with its yellow bed and his coats hung neatly upon the wall. That spring, Van Gogh exhibited three of his paintings and continued to send Theo more, hoping some would eventually sell. He made a few friends in Arles. The postman, Joseph Roland, was his favorite, and he immortalized him in one of his best paintings. He seemed consumed by a restless electric energy, working quickly, averaging as much as one painting a day. In 1888, Van Gogh's friend Gauguin, at the urging of Theo, finally agreed to visit Arles. 
He and Van Gogh set up house together, working in the day and spending their nights at a bistro drinking absinthe, a popular French liqueur that Van Gogh favored. It was a tempestuous relationship, doomed before it even started. Both were temperamental, and many arguments ensued. One night, Van Gogh threw a glass of absinthe at Gauguin. When the angry Gauguin threatened to leave, Van Gogh then chased him with an open razor. Finally, after the frightened and disgusted Gauguin had departed, Van Gogh took the razor to his own ear, slicing off the earlobe. He put it in an envelope and had it delivered to a prostitute. Later, he painted a well-known portrait of himself, right ear swathed in bandages, his look somewhat dazed, somewhat remorseful. Brother Theo rushed to Van Gogh's bedside, and after a short period of recovery, Van Gogh was back at his easel. Van Gogh often spoke to Theo about the torments of his mind. He once wrote, One cannot always tell what it is that keeps us shut in, confines us, seems to bury us. But however, one feels certain barriers, certain gates, certain walls. Is all this imagination, fantasy? I do not think so. And then one asks, My God, is it for long? Is it forever? Is it for eternity? By now, people in the village of Arles had become wary of the strange artist in residence. No one would pose for him, and children peeked in his windows and made fun of him. Afraid to be left alone, Van Gogh had himself admitted to an asylum about 12 miles outside of Arles. He was eventually given a studio in which to work and the freedom to wander outdoors and paint the wheat fields and olive orchards. He remained in the asylum for 12 months, alternating between moods of calmness and moods of deep despair. He wrote to Theo, I am working like mad and feel a blind rage to work more than ever. Finally, Van Gogh's work was beginning to attract attention. Ten paintings were exhibited, he received a flattering review in a French newspaper, and he made his first and only sale, the Red Vineyard. None of it helped. In spring of 1890, Van Gogh slipped into a severe depression and placed himself in the care of a homeopathic doctor named Paul Ferdinand Gachet, a friend of Camille Pissarro and Paul Cézanne. Gachet was located in a village 20 miles outside of Paris called Over. There, Vincent rented an attic room and proceeded to paint the small houses of the village, the endless wheat and cornfields, the river valley, the church, and portraits of Dr. Gachet. He worked with great intensity and speed, trying desperately to ward off the feelings of hopelessness which threatened to consume him. He began to quarrel with Gachet, claiming he was making no recovery, and he began to feel guilty about his lifelong dependence on Theo. Then, one day, he took the revolver of his landlord and slipped outside, easel and brushes in hand. While painting stacks of yellow hay, he stopped, aimed the revolver at his chest, and fired. The bullet hit a rib and missed the heart. Van Gogh crawled back to the house, and a doctor was called. Theo rushed from Paris to be at his brother's bedside. Van Gogh lived two more days. Then he said simply, I wish I could go home now. And he took his last breath. Theo was so distraught by his brother's death that he himself went mad three months later. His wife took him back to Holland, where he lived an additional three months, then went on to join his older brother. Before Theo died, he had written a letter to his sister about Vincent. It read, He was a great artist. To be a great man often goes hand in hand. Time will bring the honor due him, and many will grieve to think he died so young. The letter was prophetic. It was not long after Van Gogh's death that the world began to appreciate what it had lost. A one-man show of his works occurred in 1892, two years after he'd killed himself. His fame began to rise in the early 20th century and has grown steadily since, so that his works are now the most valuable in all of art. Today, Van Gogh is held to be the greatest Dutch painter since Rembrandt and one of the greatest artists in history. It is a moving tribute to a man who sold only one painting in his lifetime, who saw only one published article about his work, who was held by most who knew him to be a failure at both art and life. The career of Vincent van Gogh was unusual in many ways. He started later than most artists, not settling on his vocation until he was already an adult, and had tried many other professions. He produced all of his art in a very short period, 10 years, compared to, say, da Vinci, who worked for 70 years. Yet, in those 10 years, he produced 1,700 pieces of art. 
Most of his art was condensed into a brief 29 months towards the end of his life. In the last 70 days of his life, he painted 70 canvases. These last great works demonstrate just how much he had grown and expanded from his early days of the Dutch period. The Potato Eaters, produced in 1885, was typical of the Dutch period and was Van Gogh's first masterpiece. Like most of his paintings from that time, The Potato Eaters is an expression of the deep compassion he had for the poor and a lifelong interest in peasants as artistic subjects. The subjects of this picture are a family of peasants, like those he knew when he worked as a missionary in the coal mining villages. They're gathered around a crude wooden table in their humble cottage, sharing a meal that consists only of potatoes. In this work, as in all of his early works, Van Gogh used earth colors and dark shades of greenish brown and gray. Later, taking inspiration from the Impressionists and from Japanese painters he admired, he would gradually lighten his palette until he finally arrived at the bold, vibrant hues that he's now famous for. Early works like The Potato Eaters were more distinctive for their strong lines and shapes and for the way they reflect the artist's deep feelings for the common people. Another Van Gogh classic is The Night Café, painted in Arles in exchange for the rent he couldn't pay. The café was open throughout the night and was a refuge for people who had no place to sleep. The clock above the door in the painting reads 15 minutes past midnight. Men are asleep at tables, their heads buried in their arms. Four gas lights hang above a green billiard table, casting a dull lemon glow on the scene beneath. Vincent thought it was the ugliest picture he had ever done. He told Theo, I have tried to express, as it were, the powers of darkness in a low wine shop, and all this is is an atmosphere like a devil's furnace of pale sulfur. Van Gogh's popular series of sunflowers were also created in the aural period when he worked in the little yellow house in the countryside. During this period, Van Gogh painted in a frenzy using broad rhythmic strokes, swirling lines, and intense colors. It was here that he developed the distinct style now so strongly associated with him. He demonstrated a particular fondness for yellow, saying, It is the symbol of love and kindness, the color of the all-warming sun. Starry Night was painted outdoors by the light of a street lamp. It's known for its dazzling stars, its overall explosive effect, and its reflection of the wild energy of its creator. Gold stars swirl. Cypress trees look like moving flames, reaching up to a cosmic blue sky that seems to have gone mad. Electric waves emanate from the stars, and the crescent moon seems as gold and vibrant as the sun. Wheatfield with Crows, painted in 1890, is remarkable for two reasons. One is that it is possibly the last picture Van Gogh painted. The other is the intensity of desperate emotions it reveals. The dark sky is ominous and threatening. A road leads into a distant nowhere. Crows hover like bats. It is a painting of foreboding, somewhat similar to his earlier paintings in its dark, somber mood. And it captures all the anguish and loneliness that would lead to a suicide shortly after. In all his later works, the genius of Van Gogh was his use of color. I want to paint something eternal, which we seek to give by the variations of our coloring, he said. He believed that colors, like music, vibrate. His colors are so bright, you can almost smell the fragrance of his flowers and feel the heat of his sun. Along with his stunning use of color was Van Gogh's broad, bold use of his brush strokes. These strokes give everything a sense of movement. Wheat dances, people almost blink, trees and flowers dance. Perhaps more than any other artist, he used his canvas as a mirror for his emotions. His style was spontaneous and instinctive. He worked quickly and feverishly, anxious to catch the mood of the moment. Van Gogh's new and bold style made him an important bridge between the 19th and 20th centuries. This bright, colorful vision opened a new world for artists to come. He influenced both German Expressionism and the Fauvism movement of the early 1900s. Fauvists, like the famous Henri Matisse, were notable for their use of flaming, brilliant colors. Matisse had been heavily influenced by a Van Gogh retrospective he attended in 1901. There would be others who would be influenced by Vincent van Gogh, other artists, and millions of admirers. Yet, perhaps what is most stirring about his work is not the colors, not the brush strokes, nor the strong lines, but the artist's dedication to God and his determination to showing the beauty of God's world through nature. 
This became a theme in Van Gogh's paintings, and it was a theme that never faltered. Everything in his paintings vibrates with energy. Everything is alive with a divine presence. Though desperately poor his entire life, his genius unrecognized and unappreciated by all but a few, and perpetually haunted by dementia, his faith in what he had to communicate sustained him. Everything that is really good and beautiful, he said, everything of inward moral, spiritual, and sublime beauty in human beings and in their works comes from God.